principles will help your congregation. The title originally that Dave Miller had suggested was Raising Funds in the Church. And I wrote back and I said, Dave, you know, I think that maybe we ought to change the title because people may be under the impression that this is how-to course, you know, how to, how to get people to pledge and all this other thing. And that's not what it is. The title of the class is Should the Church Raise Funds as a Business? Many congregations are turning to uh, uh, various techniques. For some time, it's been a, this trend has bothered me. It affects both the liberal and the conservative churches. The trend is this ever-increasing number of congregations who are charging fees for various services, and those who raise funds through dinners, car washes, raffles, and all these things, in some large congregations, it seems that just about every program and luncheon has a fee. Now, this reminds me of the fact uh, or the time when my family and I spent a summer up in Iowa. We were doing mission work up there. It was one of those things where you go and spend a summer with a, an older missionary, and we were, uh, my wife and I were up there, and, and uh, one of the many differences between our congregation and the denominational churches. There were many differences. But one of the many differences was the fact that we didn't charge things for our services. And the residents of the town noticed it. And the residents of the town also noticed that we didn't have fish fries and bingo and garage sales and magazine campaigns. In fact, I got a rather hateful call from a uh, denominational preacher. It was a Lutheran preacher. It was just down the street from us. And it so happened that we had scheduled our vacation Bible school the same week as his vacation Bible school, and we were not charging a tuition. Let me tell you, that fellow was not upset because uh, of the lack of teaching of children. He said nothing about that. He said nothing about Bible teaching or converting the parents of the children. He was upset because he was losing the tuition revenue that he normally got during that week. In fact, his words, I remember them implicitly, how dare you, he said, not charge a vacation Bible school tuition. Now, I want to stop here for a moment. If you're making notes, I want to make this very clear. First of all, we have said in all of our teachings that it does not matter what I think, and it does not matter what you think. What does matter is what? what the Bible says, what God thinks. And brothers and sisters, if we really believe that, if we truly believe that, we have to practice that in all areas of the church, not just in the areas of instrumental music and baptism and taking weekly Lord's Supper, but in all areas. And yet, so often when we get into some other issues, especially when we talk about issues of money, Arguments I don't get are from the Bible. The arguments I get is, oh, I don't think this is wrong. And how many of you, have you, have you been in a, a home situation teaching somebody in the home and they'd say, oh, well, uh, we worship with a guitar or with a piano. And you'd say, you go through all your evidence and they say, oh, I don't think it's wrong. How many of you had that experience or with some other doctrinal issue? How do you cope with that? It frustrates you, doesn't it? And think how frustrated I am when I see my own brethren doing the same thing. Second thing I want to note is that whatever you apply to any of the acts of worship, you have to apply to all the acts of worship. Do you believe that? Whatever you apply to any of the acts of worship, you have to apply to all the acts of worship. How many of you heard the very fine lesson yesterday called Variety in Music. How many of you here believe that it is okay to use instrumental music in worship services? Okay, then I don't have to do any of that teaching there. And that's fine. Let's uh, go down to the blackboard for just a minute, or the green board, <laughs> and, and look at a parallel analysis. A parallel analysis, when you take one analysis 
and then you compare it to another item. I bet that sounded great on the tape. <laughs> okay. We have five acts of worship. One of those acts of worship is giving. It is not a part of the Lord's Supper, but a lot of times, a lot of congregations, it's done at the same time as the Lord's Supper, simply as a matter of convenience. Some people say it's also an appropriate time, and it probably is an appropriate time because <clears throat> the, uh, you're just taking the Lord's Supper, you're contemplating what he has given to us, so we're now giving back a portion of what he has given us in his mercy. Let's look at instrumental music and in worship. First of all, is music an element, or singing an element, uh, in the worship of the church? Yes or no? Yes. 1 Corinthians 14, of course you can look at all the other passages for that. Is giving of our funds an element of worship? Okay, yes. And we could talk about many other passages there. Okay, what is authorized uh, in terms of our music in worship? What type of music is authorized by the Bible? Vocal, singing, a cappella, whatever term you want to use. That's two L's. And we can talk about Ephesians 5, and verse 19, Colossians 3, and verse 6, uh, 16, and so forth. But follow this analysis. Only free will offering is authorized for New Testament worship. The same passages we quoted here talk only about free will offering. It does not talk about charging for counseling. It does not call, talk about charging tuition for Bible Bowl. It does not talk about charging for any of the services that we have in the church. It only authorizes free will giving, period. Only free will giving is authorized. First Corinthians 16, 1 through 2, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15, and there are several other passages that we could discuss uh, along those issues. The New Testament is silent about uh, concerning the use of instrumental music in worship, isn't it? Likewise, the New Testament is silent about other forms of fundraising. It mentions none. Therefore, the conclusion on instrumental music is that the church should use only a cappella. And if you're doing the same parallel analysis and if you're making the same applications and you're not being like our Baptist friends who base their religion on what they think, but you're basing your religion based on what the scriptures authorize, then you have to come up with the same conclusion that only free will offerings are authorized. Only free will offerings. And then some of us who are a little bit more savvy, who know that you can look at the history of the church to see 
if that's the way it's supposed to be done, we look at the history of the church and we say, well, man, for five, six, seven, eight centuries, they didn't have instrumental music in the church. How many of you have said that from the pulpits? The same historical argument applies to free will giving. And you can look at that in your historical evidences. And I have quoted one source there in the uh, book. Now looking at that parallel analysis then, we see that the Bible has only authorized one way of raising funds for the church, and that is free will offerings by its membership. Now I didn't say go down to the temple of Zeus and, and raise funds, did I? I said free will offerings by its membership. Now there are four principles that we must look at and uh, some of this will be a little bit repetitious but I, w please bear with me. First of all, principle number one, if you're writing notes, put this down. The Bible authorizes only free will offerings by a church's membership to support a local congregation and its sister congregations. And I add that because as we look into the life of Paul and you see the, uh, the fact that he is going through uh, the Gentile churches raising funds from behalf of the Jewish Christians who are suffering. So it is appropriate to be charitable from one congregation to another. And I don't think anybody would deny that. But have we forgotten that these free will offerings were the church's only source of revenue? Have we forgotten the great faith that it took to support the church in this manner? The first century church did not find it necessary to support its benevolent program by charging for counseling or by soliciting non-members. Instead, the dedicated Christians sold their property and they gave their proceeds to the church, Acts 4, 34-37. The contribution itself became Paul's testimony. Paul wrote concerning the Macedonians, he says, their poverty has overflowed in a wealth of liberality on their part, for they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own free will. And this, not as we expected, but first they gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. 2 Corinthians 8, 2-5. It was through these brethren's giving that the grace of God was demonstrated. If you look there in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians 8, Paul used the Macedonian example to encourage the Corinthian Christians to contribute to the needs of the Jewish saints. And the giving became a test of service which glorified God. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 13. Brethren, Principle number two, do not make a distinction between the poor and the non-poor. James 2, 1 through 6. The church may not make any distinctions such as these. To make distinctions between the poor and the non-poor is both a sin and a dishonor to the poor. That's what James says here in James 2. To require a poor man to stand in the back of the assembly and then to give the seat of the honor to the rich man is wrong. Few churches I, that I know of would ever do such a thing. Yet when a congregation charges for its programs, it always runs the risk of excluding the poor. Even to require an admission charge for an activity and then to say, pay if you only have it, still makes a distinction between the poor and the non-poor. And let me tell you this. Anyone who doesn't think that charging for a service excludes the poor obviously has never been poor. And I'm talking really poor. Often the poor members sit silently in the back and they slip out and they do not attend when such programs are scheduled. And I'm telling you this honestly. Brethren, I was working with a man over in, uh, in, Mundy, near, in the Mundy area 
who had lived here in Fort Worth. And at first it was very difficult to get a Bible study with him. And after getting a Bible study with him one day, after we become pretty good friends, he said, you know, Larry, I, at, at first I really didn't want to study with you. I didn't even want to talk with you. He said, I thought that the Church of Christ was a rich man's church. See, he'd been here in Fort Worth, and he'd been doing pretty well. And he had attended one of the nearby congregations. And then, business went bad. His wife and his uh, wife's family got every penny that he had left once the business went belly up. He was living over here, not too far from this church building, a little bit closer to another church building that will remain nameless. He was living in a woman's garage that she had converted into a little apartment, paying somewhere around $50, $60 a, a month, and he was having trouble paying that. He was working for a local fast food place, and that's how low he had sunk. He had nothing. And he was walking to church, and every activity had a charge. And he was sensitive to it. And brothers, he needed the counseling, and the counseling cost him. He needed the fellowship more so. He didn't really need the counseling. He knew what his problems were, and he was working. He was probably one of the best well-adjusted men I've ever seen. I think that if something like that had happened to me, I'd probably be less well-adjusted than he. I hope I could adjust as well as he could. But he needed the fellowship and the assurance, and he didn't have it. He was not attending because they were being charged. A good friend of mine that I have worked with in teenage uh, classes, uh, he's now in a college group. His dad is a preacher, and he said all his life he wanted to go to Bible camp, but he couldn't because they could not afford the tuition. Now, brothers and sisters, we are neglecting our poor. And you want to know one of the reasons why we're not growing? It's because we're after the wasp. We're after the middle class white Americans. And they're not the ones that respond. When Jesus was ordained to preach the gospel, he mentioned two classes. And the first class he mentioned was the poor. It is the poor that respond to the gospel. And if you've ever done any door knocking, you can go into the middle class section of town and you may get one or two responses. You can go into the rich section of town, you're lucky if you get one. But if you go down in a poor section of town, you're finding people hurting and you're finding people that are interested in the word of God and your best responses. If you've done personal work, you know what I'm talking about. And yet we're excluding our poor by charging for all these activities. Should the church have an activity or a service it cannot finance out of its treasury, wouldn't it be better to suggest a contribution amount per member and have its members either add that amount to their Sunday contribution or to place that amount in a basket at the event located in an inconspicuous place? Wouldn't it be better to do that? I have done dinners in which... We, because of the large crowd, we needed to buy the meat or something somewhere else because it was going to be a real imposition for members to try to provide that. And when we have done that, we've just put a little box in the back. And we made a little announcement saying, this cost about $3 per person or $2 per person or whatever it is. Some of our members can't afford that that are here. Some of our people can't afford that that are here. Some can, and some can afford a little more. Whatever you can afford, if you can contribute a little bit to that amount. But it's whack here in the back, and I don't want anybody looking to see who, who goes back there. And it's an inconspicuous place. And brethren, I have never, never, never collected less than what we needed. Never. Furthermore, we have gone to doing our camps that way. We don't require the kids to pay a tuition. We tell the parents of these kids, and we tell the kids this is what it costs, and we put a box in the back, and we say remain as anonymous as you can, and put your money in that box if you can. It'd be $100 per person. If you can't, don't worry about it. 
And we're not going to pay attention who puts it in there. And we make an announcement. We've got eight kids wanting to go to camp. We need $800 or $900 or whatever it is. Uh, and see what you can do. And we've never been short. But we have made the decision that if we are short, or if we can't finance that, then we're not doing it. We're going to find some alternative. Because we're not going to exclude not one person because they can't pay. Now, that leads us to the third biblical guideline. And something we forgot is to keep the left hand from knowing what the right hand is doing. In Matthew chapter 6, 3 and 4. Now, I understand that that you have to take that principle based with some other principles. But that is a basic, honest principle of giving. It comes from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself. And it's interesting to me that the first recorded act of discipline in the church was over the sin of pride. And what type of pride? was because people knew who was giving what. And that, of course, is Ananias and Sapphira. Now, that doesn't mean that that was wrong that they put that, that money at the apostles' feet. I think the apostles would not have done something like that if it was wrong to do it that way. But the very first act of discipline was over the sin of pride because they knew how much somebody was contributing. Acts 5, 1 through 11. And when it comes uh, known who can and who cannot afford paying for an event, this principle is violated. The Scottish brethren have an interesting way of participating in their contribution on Sunday. They have a little device that's uh, not like our plates. They have this long sock-like device. And they pass it to you, and you put your money in your hand, and you put your money at your hand all the way down the sock and let go so that no one knows what you're giving. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I'm not saying that we have to do that. But I think that's a beautiful expression of this principle. Principle number four, lest we get off onto this tangent, because I know I, I kind of anticipate this question to come up. Principle number four is that Christians should practice good stewardship of everything they own. Luke 16, 1 through 13. Proper use and disposition of material things is required of all Christians. And if you're making notes, Matthew 6, 20, Matthew 19, and verse 21, and Luke 14, and verse 14. This stewardship applies to items that are purchased for the work of the Lord. A photocopier used to reproduce Bible lessons or weekly bulletins may be sold when it needs replacing or becomes obsolete. A bus or van may be traded in toward the purchase of a new transport, but it must be understood that these items should not be purchased for the purpose of resale. The motivation for the original purpose was not for commerce, but for ministry. And there's the difference. I would make this comment, however. I, I know that 40 years ago, that when the brethren had something that they were using in their ministry and they didn't need it anymore or it wore out or they used to look around for a congregation first that could use that before they went to resell it. I will make that comment. The first photocopier I had in my ministry was donated to us from another congregation. They upgraded their photocopier and they gave us ours because they knew we needed one. And they, for, they forwent the, the, the trade-in value. But principle number four is that Christians should practice good stewardship of everything they own. Now the conclusion. In the congregations that I have served, I have never felt it necessary to charge for any programs or ministries. I'm sad to say that in the very first couple of years of my ministry, because I had not studied out these issues, I did begin charging for these things. But, but once I became convinced that the Bible tells us that only free will offerings are the way to go, then we started uh, supporting our things through only free will offerings. Mission trips were always financed by special contributions, along with contributions made by the young people attending. We were very sensitive to their needs, very sensitive to their abilities. 
Some teens who wanted to contribute, who had no jobs, we found them jobs. Any meals that we had that needed additional funding always received more in free will offerings than by charging an omission. This was done without embarrassment to the poor. To raise funds by ways not authorized by the Bible is just as wrong as using non-authorized musical instruments in our worship services. And with the current climate that is caused by the prosecution of the so-called television evangelists and their unethical money-raising procedures, it is best that we distance ourselves from even a hint of their sin. I hope that you all saw the truth and love program last Sunday. Wonderful program. I believe it was a repeat um, on counterfeit religion. How many of you saw that? Those first three points had to do with fundraising. And I recommend that you look at that. It is a wonderful show. We've got to distance ourselves from these type of people. We, as members of the Lord's Church, should make sure that we are never even considered similar to those despicable people who promote re, uh, religion for the purpose of financial gain. And, of course, there are several passages that we could look at, such as Titus 1.11, 1 Timothy 6.5, and 2 Corinthians 11.7-15. 7 now I'm going to leave you with two questions for conclusion. And then you can ask me questions, and I'm sure that there's going to be some people mad because, uh, unfortunately, I really think that money is where some people's hearts are. Somehow, they, uh, in some people, it's almost an addiction. But let me ask you this. Is there a similarity between marketing in the church and the merchants of the temple during the first cleansing? It was to these that people that Jesus said, take these things away, you shall not make my father's house a house of trade at the first cleansing. John 2 and verse 16. Somebody check me out on that. Does not say den of thieves. That was at the second cleansing. You shall not make my father's house a house of of trade. Number two. And here's a big question to all those really suave fundraising preacher friends of mine. And I, I'm, I'm serious about this. If the church is authorized to raise funds through marketing, why should we emphasize weekly free will giving? Why don't we just support the church by what we sell? Why don't we sell memberships like the Chamber of Commerce and sell our maps and sell our brochures, our tracks? You can find that in the denominational churches. Why don't we sell books and holy water and pieces of the cross instead of emphasizing free will giving if we can support through marketing? Well, my friends, I hope you don't think that I don't love you. I love every one of you. And I, I love the, the brethren, even though those, there are some brethren who are not using these principles in their, in their free will. I still love them with all my heart. But I sincerely, honestly believe that we're going to have to take a closer look. And if we're expecting people to give up mechanical instruments and music, we're going to have to abide by the same logic and the same biblical principles in our giving as part of the church. Brethren, that's my conclusion. Do you have any questions? Yes. Well, listen, I like challenges. That is, now, I don't mind answering that, but that is a peripheral issue. And I, we can talk about other days of the week. 
Uh, I know that there's some congregations that, uh, you know, somebody is sick, you know, there, there have been, and I think it's unfortunate. I think it violates the principle of the Good Samaritan that if somebody has a need and, and uh, you know, we don't have to wait till Sunday to, to contribute to that need. I mean, the, the Good Samaritan paid for his, the, 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 uh, the, fellow, the unfortunate fellow's wounds at that time. Uh, but on the other hand, our, our, our regularly planned, authorized contribution, what we plan to do, we should do on Sunday. Now, we sing, don't we? And we sing other days of the week. Uh, most of you probably have a midweek service, probably on Wednesday, which is traditional, by the way. It's not something we have to do on Wednesday or whatever day of the week that you want to do it on. But if you have a, you, you come in and you have worship, don't you? You sing on that day of the week. Now, on the other hand, I see what you're coming from because it says on the first day of the week as you gather together, give as you prosper. Uh, and that's a very real issue. I think that as an act of worship, just as an act of worship, it needs to be done on Sunday. When it's an act of charity that has to be done to for somebody's sake. Okay. Uh, what, what, why don't we come over here and then we'll come back to you. Yes. I read in the past where uh, the pastor, uh, the pastor uh, have a uh, drug sale or car wash before you come to the Yeah, you know, if some kids come up to my, my teenagers, for instance, they they want to have to, they wanted to have a garage sale, and I said that's fine. You can do a garage sale if you want to, and it's your money. And if you guys want to go out here and blow it at the arcade or go to the Dairy Queen and blow it, that's your money. But if you want to give a portion of that to the Lord, I think that'd be wonderful. I think you ought to do that. And they they did, but they also had a pizza party with part of it. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I, you know, we see that all the time. In fact, I've got two or three or four bulletins. I've stuck a bunch of them in here, where they're using garage sales and dinners and all that to support missionaries or to support uh, mission trips and and things like that. And that's unauthorized. No, they were doing that. Uh, the what we're saying here is that that's unauthorized to do that in the name of the church, to do that as a church function. Let's do a garage sale. Let's do a car wash to support our missionary. That is not what the Lord wants us to do. He doesn't want us going after non-members' money or even members' money as a part of trade to support because that shows a lack of faith. That, that ruins our faith right there. And the brethren had uh, potentials for trade. I mean, they had all of this property. And it's interesting that the, uh, that the first century Christians did not give the property to the apostles to dispose of. They sold the property. And the money was theirs. That's what Peter's point is to, to, to Ananias there. Yeah, that money was yours to do with what you wanted to. And, if, you know, and, and, the, and the sin was not in giving the portion of the money. The sin was in the fact that they lied about the portion. He was representing it as being the whole amount. But if he had said no, then there would have been no sin there. Now, yeah. Okay. Okay. A publishing company. Yeah, something like that. Just uh, producing material. Mm -hmm. Is that 
you know, I'm a pretty sensitive to the publishing company. I used to, I worked uh, several years for Brother Leon Ramsey and, and later Benny Whitehead at Quality Publishing Company. In fact, Leon Ramsey hired me as the, uh, with the idea that eventually I would be the full-time, first full-time editor of Christian Bible Teacher. That's kind of an interesting sideline. It's okay for a, a brethren to uh, produce good quality or good top-notch materials for the church. Brother Brownlow has done that. And it's not part of the church. It's strictly commerce. Um, I think that's a fine endeavor. We need more convicted brotherhood publishers. I brought 20 of my manuscripts on the birth of Christ here, and I've got three left. And yet, when I've submitted them to a couple of Brotherhood publishers, they said, we can't do that. It's such a sensitive issue because it looks like we're endorsing Christmas. Well, you know, my point is, is that we need to demyth the birth of Christ and talk about the reality of the birth of Christ. And I think that's why there's only three of those manuscripts left back there. Uh, people are taking those things, and they, 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 they teach on those things. Uh, we need good, top-notch publishers and we've got uh, Robert Dodson and I uh, did a an article a while back. He used part of that in his in his section on abortion, uh, and I submitted it to one of the Brotherhood publishers. And he, uh, I met the publisher at one of the lectureships. He said, "We're not going to print that article. So we don't print controversial issues." And I said, "Since when is abortion a controversial issue among members of the church?" But uh, we need top notch, dedicated. Brotherhood publishers. Now, on the other hand, a church that's doing a publication and is charging a fee, now they can suggest a contribution amount, but if they are charging a fee, then they're wrong. And they need to really consider. And I don't and I think what it is is that they have not sat down and considered the issue. They're just like Alexander Campbell, who didn't really consider baptism until the birth of his child. And then that's when he got to studying and found out that he was wrong. And then he rectified the issue. And I think we need to do the same thing. Do we have any other questions? Yes, brother. What is the difference between uh, contribution and donation? Nothing. Just different words. Contribution, donation, same thing. Free will offering. That, that's all the same thing. Do we have any other questions? <laughs> And listen, brother, if I'm wrong, I want to know. I really sincerely do. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, you know, that is, that is a thing. Fact is, I went through a spell in my life where I did not give a check because I didn't want people knowing what I was giving. The, uh, if you look at Peter and the fact that they knew there was a little bit being known, I mean, there was a known amount there uh, in the contribution given at the feet of Peter at Ananias and Sapphira and also Barnabas. Uh, in fact, our brethren used to have a, I thought it was a very unfortunate thing that they did. They had a, a practice of, and it's, and they could do it today, I mean, it, but I just don't think it's as good as passing a plate. They used to uh, have a table out front, and after the services, or part of the services, everybody would come up front and put their contribution on that table. <laughs> and I don't think that would, you know, that I don't think that's a good practice. Uh, just, just my personal opinion, but that's a matter of opinion there. Uh, I have worked through that, and I don't think there's anything wrong with using a check. Uh, I think that the elders need to be real careful who they use to to count the checks and put it, you know, and put it the deposit for for other things too. You know, they got to be honest and everything, but they also need to be people that are discreet. And uh, I tell you, I've counted those checks before, and when I got through, I didn't remember. Who gave what? <laughs> so, I, and that might be just me, but, uh, you know, if you've ever done that, you know what I'm talking about. After you get through running through, 
and I, and I, and I, and I, is it okay for somebody to get them write a check? Oh, yes. I tell my brother that it's all right for them to send me uh, to write a check for the church every week. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> you had a. And by the way, brother, this we're still getting. I, I, yes, that's that's true. I, by the way, these are peripheral issues. So we even I've even had people ask about the treasury, whether that was scriptural or not. And I, I do want to recommend a book in the back of the the article in the book in our lectureship book, which is a good thing. You ought to have that. I have recommended uh, Sound Doctrine by Brother Nichols. I'm surprised by the number of conservative brethren that do not have that five volume set. That is a really good set. But the volume that I recommend in the footnotes there has a section on church finance. See, I'm not original with this. I mean, they've been talking, conservative brethren have been talking about this a long time. They used to have some things, they used to have the old Tom Thumb marriages that some denominational churches did. You remember those? So y'all probably not old enough. But I read about them. And they would charge and they would have kids dress up and, and, and have a marriage ceremony and everything, and they charge you. And they got a kick out of this. Especially when the, 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 the two kids getting married, you know, would kiss them. He, he really gets all over that. But what he, one of his points there is that he says that whenever, and, I, and I, of course his terminology is in the old, old time terminology, but he talks about a, 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 a handicapped man who sells pencils on the corner. And you come along and buy a pencil from him. You don't buy that pencil because you need a pencil. You, you, you buy because you pity the man. Whenever the church sells things, it's just like that handicapped man on the corner. And that non-Christian comes by and buys that pencil, not because it's a good product. They buy that because they pity you. They put you in the same situation as, as you know, it disgraces the church. Yes, and then we, one more question, and we've got to go. Uh, well, brother, I wish you could comment on the Florida class and the love of this doctrine uh, from the Bible that we have known uh, three years ago. I left the denomination because of that. Uh, I'm talking uh, a 5,000 member congregation every Sunday where what they collect maybe in this congregation, they can collect it within an hour. Uh, a brethren, uh, a so called brethren, they made 20,000. Uh, all over the world. And, uh, we must 